Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Gym, uh, the Simply Jesus podcast. I am just really excited about my guest today. Um, I have been following Matt Beckingham for the last couple of years, but he recently wrote a book called um, Three Trees that I am kind of obsessed with. So um, I want to introduce Matt. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's such a joy to be invited into this space, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, me too. I'm so glad. I um, I have mentioned this before, but I've been, uh, my son and I were reading this Three Trees book, and what we were doing is we read a chapter, and then we just discussed it because it feels like it's, um, there's so much in it. It's not overwhelming, but it's such a great book that I wanted to have a conversation with my son about what does it say about who God is. Um, so can you go ahead and just describe this book so they have a kind of general idea of what Three Trees is about? Yeah, sure. So the whole idea, one of the things that I am uh, so interested in is Eden. And I love the concept of our original design. I love the concept of Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the night with, the, with our father. And all of that, to me, was being designed in his image. And uh, I wanted to create a parable, which is, um, some people call it an allegory, but it feels like it's uh, something that Jesus would do uh, in the Gospels of teaching through a parable, uh, of taking a very familiar story. And so the story of three trees follows the exit from Edom with Adam and Eve, uh, and very much focuses on uh, the one called Cain, which often when we hear that in sermons and preachings, he he gets the the rough end. In Australia, we say the rough end of the pineapple. Uh, and it's <laughs> like he gets the worst deal out of a lot of it. And um, I found myself sitting with a character of scripture that seemed to be often treated without grace. And believing that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever, I wanted to create a story around a person that everyone else had written off but Jesus hadn't. And so in the parable form, I take the lens of what I call eagle, and uh, it's, a, it's a fictitious eagle. It's, uh, it's one who watches all the things unfold around and is a part of conversations with God that I call the designer inside of this story with Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Uh, and it, it's a place where I found that I could uh, express a lot of my curiosity around the kingdom of God and how does this thing actually work. And so I've taken a, uh, a non-fiction story, Cain and Abel, and I've put a fictional story around it. I've created my, I've given my own voice to the stories of my own journey inside of that. And so when people say, what's it all about? Well, if you've ever made the greatest mistake of your life and you've wondered if there's anything on the other side of that, where often you think there's not... <laughs> there is and jesus will always give us that space of there is and so i wanted to explore what it was like to make the greatest mistake of my life and allow then that to become the grace moment of my life where healing restoration connection with god with uh, my wife with family with people uh, and so it, it is a, a non-fiction story fictional on a real story, which is nonfiction of me. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know really where to put it, but that's kind of how I describe it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was, um, I didn't realize it was going to be so much about Cain. I'm not sure what I thought, but it was, um, it was really sweet when I got to that point And I realized that the Lord had grace for Cain, like still a consequence, but, but there mm -hmm. just seemed to be so much grace for him. It was, I was really, um, I mean, I've never heard that concept and it was, it was really sweet. Yeah, and I, I think for a lot of people inside of, of the church too, when we make great mistakes, often our church's model that we get cut off or we get put out or we get excluded and it kind of breaks my heart even saying that I can feel the emotion inside of me, but that's not what Jesus did. And so when Jesus allowed a woman to cry on his feet and everybody else in the room had a commentary on that lady, he, he had a completely different commentary, and that's the heart that I wanted to capture. I, I want to capture that. And so when I sit with people who have fallen in ministry or have made mistakes, 
I can sit with them in grace rather than, oh, well, you deserve what you, you've got coming to you. And I found, um, Cheryl, so much healing in sitting with people who felt like that they're at the end of that space where there is no more. They don't know what to do next because their sin has created a situation of punishment rather than a situation of healing. And it's not diminishing the actions that have been done. And in the story that I write, it's not just wiping away that he murdered his brother. It's about engaging with the why. It's about engaging with the consequence and the circumstances that, he's, that he was, found himself in. And for me, that's where my story found traction in this story. And, and I wanted that to become something that people could read and go, wow, yep, I've found myself in those places. or I am in those places. And is there grace for me? Yes. Yes is the answer, and yes is always the answer, I think, with Jesus. Uh, like even a criminal on a cross, Jesus, yes, right beside him became the life-giving moment of his entire life. I, I want to be that expression of the love of God to anybody that I meet. And so when I hear about how you're reading this story to your son, that to me gives your son uh, an opportunity to encounter grace at such a young age so that when he grows and, and when he makes mistakes and he's like, oh, no, what's mum going to think or what's mm -hmm. God going to think, he has a paradigm where he can see grace and mo have grace modelled to him. And for a mother who chooses to read to her son like this and then process his questions, Cheryl, I grew up in a time where we weren't allowed to ask questions and any questions we asked, we got told theology rather than uh, helping people understand God. And to hear what you're doing for your son, Cheryl, that makes me want to cry. Like, it's just so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a very special time um, because I think it's, you know, um, your, your relationship with Jesus can get complicated because mm. when things don't work out, like you expect, what do you do with that? And it's hard when you're younger. I mean, it's hard when you're older too, but you know, I can't just say, well, God just loves you. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't fix the, his heart. So, um, I think that's what I've really appreciated is that, um, it was giving me another language to talk to him about some of the disappointments he's had in his life. And that, that kind of leads me to one of my, um, favorite parts of, your book is there's the part I, I don't remember was it Eve that asked the designer if she could have stopped um, Abel from getting killed or something and the answer it was it was so big and profound we but my I was reading it I remember I was reading to my son we both put the book down and just started crying oh, wow. we literally did we just because we felt um, maybe a new narrative when bad things happen and you don't know what to do with it and that there really is love from the Lord that he sometimes has to allow these things to happen. And it was, um, it was a really big moment for my son and I. So those moments where tears happen and words run dry, these for me are invitations for depth in relationship and connection, not only with your son, but also with God. It's like, so often it's just these questions get answered, like I said, with theology rather than connection. And for, for many of us, there are so many things in our lives that happen and we go, I don't even know why that happened. And the church has often modeled a behavior, well, you must have sinned or you must have done something wrong or you don't believe enough, you don't pray enough, you don't tithe enough, you don't serve enough. And it often operates from that place of should and you've heard you've heard me use that phrase inside of this book a lot where yeah. friends don't use the word should and what I mean by that is when we operate from what I should have done we're operating from a place of poverty where we don't have how about we operate from a place of presence where we do have so what does your son have one he has his mother's heart right there he has his mother's tears, so he can see that situations affect her as much as they affect him. And he is then allowed to express his own disappointments. Um, and I don't know about you, Cheryl, but so often expectations, like we can put them out there, but God's like, cool, that's, that's nice. But what I'm about to do is beyond that. So yeah. I often say to people, how about we hold our expectations loosely and put expectancy into his hands and mm -hmm. whatever you've got for us, Father, we're going we're gonna to follow that lead. And so, again, to hear a mother and son doing this, Cheryl, like you should be so encouraged 
to be the one who sits there in that space to carry the pain, to listen to the questions. And even when you don't have answers, that's the thing too. Like that's why I love the analogy of Eden with the good tree of good and uh, bad and also a tree of life is often we look for black and white answers and sometimes it's just tears. And if you've got people there to sit with you in the tears, you've got life and you've got life starting to flow in all of its abundance as well. Yeah, I I did. Um, in the beginning, I found myself maybe a couple of years ago when I saw that he was questioning so much, I was trying to fix it. And the Lord was very good to me to say, Cheryl, you've got to back up and you've got to just sit with him and let him feel whatever he's feeling. But he doesn't really need your answers because the Lord has it. And mm-hmm. I don't need to come up with some kind of theology to help him get through it. And so um it's sometimes hard to not want to say something, but it's also refreshing that I don't have to have an answer. And I've been able to sit back a little bit. And I think that was so great about us reading a chapter. And then instead of me talking, I'm just asking him, what did you think about that? What do you think about what he said? And then just letting him process it on his own. Um, it seemed to be really helpful. But one of the other things I love too about the book is doubt. Do you want to talk about how you weaved um, how we the, how the enemy wants us to doubt the Lord throughout it. It was really fascinating to me. Yeah, and that's part of, I think, so much of church teaching and theology at times is on what Satan attacks rather than um, what he is attacking. And so often our doubts, our thoughts, our, our minds are the place where like, people talk about it as a battlefield of the mind. But doubt is not a bad thing when there's a question that's able to be asked. And so I've often found that if you can't ask the question, then the doubt just builds until finally you no longer believe in the very thing that you're doing. But if you're able to ask questions and your curiosity is given voice, and that's part of what your son's doing, his curiosity is giving voice. And so it's no longer than doubt is now question, it's curiosity. And if curiosity is met with grace and not judgment, you have a curiosity that grows uh, wisdom and understanding. And so for a young boy to have curiosity or even to express his doubts to a person who's willing to sit and listen to them. So often, I don't know if you found this, Cheryl, but it's not actually about the answer. It's about the deeper question. So what is it your son is really asking here? Uh, What is the heart of that? And if we can actually nurture that, then when those talking snakes come along, um, those talking snakes will learn the weight of our heel and not the openness of our ear. Uh, And that to me is part of that place of growth when our curiosity is not just defined as like doubt as often we talk about with the Bible as like a wave that gets tossed to and fro. When curiosity is given an audience, you're no longer being tossed to and fro you're now in a place of growth and you're starting to learn. And for so much of the writings that I've done, Eagle is the most curious one in the room and he has a whole bunch of questions he wants to ask. That to me would be your son in this story too, um, Cheryl. So if I wrote a story about your son, he would be like the Eagle. Mum, I've got a question. Mum, I've got a question. Yeah, that's good. Wow, I never thought about that. Um, I also just from the book was reminding my son about you know, who are you actually listening to and reminding him that the enemy is the one always trying to make you doubt. Does God really love you? Does he really want to talk to you? Um, So it was a good reminder too. I think sometimes we just need new language, you know, that I could tell my son um, when he gets kind of, you know, we all do this, we kind of spiral into a weird place and you have to just stop and say, who am I really listening to? You know, what is, what, how did I get my truth kind of mixed up and all of that, mm. that I would, um, I would for kind of forget, you know, that God ultimately just loves me and wants to have a relationship with me. Yeah. See, for me, Cheryl, and I teach on things like deliverance uh, a fair bit. And often when you talk about a talking snake, it's their identity that they go after. If a person doesn't know who they are, then doubts freely come. And what I've found in the Christian church is so often people don't know who they are. They, If you ask them, they'll talk about themselves being a sinner. But Jesus didn't call a believer a sinner. He just didn't do it. He called them by name. Even the people that were sinning, he calls them 
by name. And I think that's such a helpful thing. Like, you know, in the story of Nathaniel, where Nathaniel is sitting under a fig tree and, and his brother comes and says, hey, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel's like, what? What good thing ever comes out of Nazareth? Jesus comes along and ignores the offense and speaks to his identity. Here is a true son of Israel. And so when I'm sitting with people, like even with your son, if I was sitting with him, I would be asking the question, who is this young man? And for a young man who has gone through disappointments in the years that he has, there's a deeper question inside of that. And I'd be seeking to find who he is and to know that he's got questions and there's curiosity. This kid's a leader. And inside of that leadership is is looking for that place to be heard and to be seen. And you start seeing the identity of the one who is known as your son. That's what those talking snakes will go after. So he will never live out his true identity of who he is. And none of us like being known for our worst mistakes. And that's kind of why Cain, being known as a murderer of his brother, um, when we finally get to have a conversation with him in heaven, I believe I will, um, he will be, I'm sure, wishing that he was known by some other phrase other than murder or of brother. And so for me, it's this identity piece that is so precious and when when a person knows it that it becomes that unbreakable place it becomes that ground so when satan comes to jesus and says if you are the son of god now the most ridiculous question you'll ever ask jesus in your entire being but satan felt he had a had an angle there um jesus knew who he was and it wasn't as even if it was a suggestion so what does jesus do a bible study he says, okay, you want to talk to me about the word of God? Let's talk about it. And I love that he came from that place of security, Cheryl. And that's for all of us, for you, for me, for your son, to know who we are brings us into the very beauty of the freedom that Christ won for us on the cross. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I feel like um, a lot of my podcasts have been surrounded about identity and even the one I just released, we talked a lot about that because it does seem to be at the core of kind of everything. Because once you know who you are, you're right. You kind of become unstoppable. Not that you don't fail, but you know, you just, it's kind of hard for you to go off the wrong track because you're just like, this is what God has for me. And this is what I'm going to do. And obviously it feels good when you're walking in your purpose, you know, that the Lord made you for. Mm. Um, also, I, I'm, I'm curious, have you ever thought about doing a study guide to <laughs> that goes with three trees? Well, I've done, I've done on my website is a, is a masterclass yeah. on it where people, where okay. there's five sessions of taking that apart. Um, I've just, I've been in contact with another church in the States who the pastor has written a 32 um, chapter study guide on the book because like he was so taken by it. And he even told me man, my imagination was fired. And, and, and this man is 72 years old. Wow. And so when you have that happening, uh, and again, in that story too, Cheryl, it was his daughter who introduced him to it. And again, mm -hmm. I see that generational impact flow I can't tell you how much wonder that does for my soul to see that. It's just not oh, a cool book. It's actually there's something that you're doing that's impacting the generations. Yes. Like all day, every day, I am encouraged by that sort of thing. But I agree with you so much, Cheryl, that identity piece, that is the thing that it all hangs on and that's in the way that we do connection with other people we know people by their character not necessarily by their behavior and by god we know him by his character and there's some things in the bible i don't know about you but there's some things that are really questionable that go on right. inside the bible and you go okay god i don't see how this fits in the whole big paradigm and and you question it but the character remains the same. And that's, to me, the heart of uh, of doing this thing of called a Christian life is to discover who we are through the character of who we are created to be. And I don't know about you, Cheryl, but I find that I can rest so much easier when I'm living from a place of identity rather than striving for something that I, I don't have. Right. You're right. Whenever um, I think one of the big moments in my life is when I was struggling and I just started really studying more of the Old Testament because I needed to know who God was. I needed to understand his character. And there was something about even though I was in a waiting period, I saw the Lord be so faithful time and time again through every story. 
as other people were also waiting and maybe didn't understand why God wasn't doing what they what they thought or how they expected it. But it really blessed me. And I think it really changed something inside of me because I was so convinced at the end of that, that God was faithful and that I really could trust him and that he really did want a relationship. And so even though things got crazier after that, I had this solid ground, you know, that I could stand on that really, I think really shaped me. I love that because yeah. that's, that's the place of connection and relationship is when you're unshakable, you're in places where you feel loved and you know, you're safe. That's right. what you're giving to your son every night. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. So I know that something that with this book even is that you are encouraging us to use our imagination to connect with the Lord. Um, and so I love three trees for that, but I know you also have the ability to kind of help us maybe in a, a special prayer time to help us connect to the father. Is that something you want to talk about or maybe something you can walk us through? Yeah, absolutely. I don't mind doing both of those things. Okay. I think our imagination is a gift from God. It can't be surgically removed from us and therefore we always have it. But I think as kids in my generation, Cheryl, like we were told to stop daydreaming and our imagination lost its value. And then in church, uh, for me, been raised in a quite a conservative church, your imagination was given no, um, there was no uh, fire to <laughs> fan in that, in that one. And so it often shrinks and disappears. And so we then engage with God with what we know rather than who he is. So a number of years ago, um, I just started helping people engage their imagination again. And what I found was that, it wasn't just for me a time of prayer where I could actually imagine hanging out with Jesus. It now became something that became very personal for other people as well. And all of the writings that I'm doing now, so Three Trees, Three Floods has followed that. It comes from a place of my own imagination of sitting with our Heavenly Father um, and initially in Three Trees in Eden, in our place of creation. Uh, and I have this belief that when I start in prayer, I start from a place of Eden because that's the place Jesus uh, one for us on the cross where nothing separates us from his love. So no sin, no, no demon, no, nothing can separate us from his love. And so when I invite people to pray with me, I ask them just to imagine themselves in Eden and let their imagination do all the work. And so we can remind ourselves of the stories of Eden and go, oh, okay, that's what I imagine. But I often find when I'm doing this with Australians, they're imagining somewhere in, uh, in the Australian uh, outback or the forest or the bush, we call it. When I'm doing it with Americans, uh, Texans are out there on the, on the hill country or they're doing something where it feels very familiar right. and very safe. And so when people are praying, I get them to often start from that place of where is your happy place? Where is the place that you feel safe? And if you guys are watching and listening along, I often just invite people to close their eyes and imagine the safest place that they have been and allow all of their senses to come alive. So not just the thoughts, but not just your, the things that you can see, but the things that you can feel, the things that you can smell. And so for me, it's the beach. I love it. I can put my hands into the sand. And I'm, but for anyone who's watching, put yourself wherever you are, you feel safe and allow that to be a moment of Eden where nothing separates you from his love. In that space, once you've taken time to notice everything around you, even you might feel the wind or smell the trees or smell the sea or whatever it is, invite Jesus to come and sit with you. He is the ultimate gentleman. He will not force himself into a conversation. He will not do uh, anything that is out of character with who he is. Invite Jesus to come and to sit with you and allow him, his presence, to be something that you sense, something that you feel. So maybe it's like when somebody sits next to you and you can feel that person's closeness. Maybe he's sitting opposite you and you can feel his presence even looking at you. Allow your imagination again to do the work. What's he doing? What's he saying? Could he be praying? Could he be laughing? Could he be sharing? Could he be waiting for a question? Prayer for me is a conversation. It's two ways. 
And so I'll often say, Jesus, what is on your heart? Mm. And he often says back to me a phrase that I've written in all my books is, uh, what do you see, Matt? And it allows me then into a conversation with him. So if you're watching and listening along and you find yourself in your happy place, sitting with Jesus, allow it to be a moment where he speaks. Use your imagination. And often people go, but it's my imagination. It's flawed. It's sinful. It's unclean. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, it tells you that you have the mind of Christ. In Acts, it tells you what Jesus has declared to be clean. Let no one declare unclean. In Peter, it tells you you share the divine nature of God. If you believe for these things, then you understand the power of the cross of what Christ has done for you. Allow your thoughts to be made known, spoken to him. Allow his voice. If you struggle with the concept of hearing God um, in this way, think about a Bible verse. The very first one that drops into your mind can often be the one that God wants to speak into your spirit. What does the verse mean to you? Allow yourself to interpret that verse in the context of your, your situation, your circumstance, your moment, and allow his voice then to speak into your spirit. When you're doing these things, my friends, this is the space for me, what I call Eden. Nothing separates you from, from him. He is full of grace. He is full of love. And he's wanting to impart his life in fullness, not in half measure, not in quarter measure, in fullness. He wants you to rest. He wants you to know that you are not only loved, but you are seen, you belong, you are with him, and he's going nowhere. Wow, that's so good. And I would just encourage our listeners, if you are not in a place where you can do this right now, um, then rewatch it, go back and rewind it and get in a quiet place and experience God in a brand new way because he wants to meet you there. Um, I just, I really feel just it's so heavy on my heart that the Lord wants to meet you um, in this time and in a new way, you know, via your imagination. So thank you, Matt, for that. It's beautiful. My pleasure, Cheryl. It's, I think, part of introducing people to using the way God has made them to interact is it's life-giving. And when you hear of what people are seeing and experiencing, you quickly get to see what the Father's doing in their lives. And it's just, it's, for me, it's such a joy. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, go buy Three Trees. It's like Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's on Matt's website, which is Greater Things International. Um, it's a it's a book you can read with your kids. Obviously, we said that, but it's um, it's not very long. So I would love for you to grab that. Um, and if you want to find out more information about Matt, you can find him on Facebook and Instagram, all the places under uh, Greater Things International. So thank you, Matt, for coming. It's my pleasure, Cheryl.